How they coming? Hey, Paul, how do you like your meat cooked? Well done. Well done? You sure you want meat? I could have Susan make you a salad. Oh, I meant done well. You know, not well done. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, medium, I guess. Medium. So you gonna cook all the flavor out of it? Medium for Sarah. <laughs> I want mine medium rare. No, I want red. You know, if I could, I'd just slice the meat out of a live cow and then just warm it up with a space heater. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, sometimes I don't even leave it on long enough to melt the cheese. Well then, this one is perfect for you. You enjoy that, man. familiar with social media. Now, if you might not be, uh, the majority of you maybe are, but if you aren't, then let me tell you about one um, certain Instagram, um, social media platform called Instagram. Now, Instagram, essentially, is a collection of pictures that you post that are supposed to represent your life. Now, there we go. I've got an Instagram account, um, at Sadara Demel, in case anyone's wondering. Um, there you go. <laughs> So, and this is a collection of pictures that I've posted probably in the last six months. So this is what my feed, my Instagram feed looks like. And I don't know if you can see it very clearly on your screen, but you know, we've got pictures of some holidays over there. We've got some pictures of food over here. We've got smiling people over there and oh look, more food over here. And, and look, there's pictures of smiling people and oh, beaches and oh look, food again. Well, you get the general idea. Now you see, all of these pictures, if you look at them pretty closely, you think, well, that looks pretty all right, isn't it? Like, she's living a pretty good life. Like, you know, this is, this is going really well. And yeah, that all looks amazing. But here's the thing. All of these pictures are a collection of my best moments. They're a collection of my greatest hits moments. They're once in a lifetime bucket list moments. They're my highlight reel. So in preparation for this message, I, I did something different on Instagram this week. I, um, I posted a video of what a typical day looks like for me, or looked like for me last week. And this is what it looked like. No, that, that was it. That is pretty much it. Now, it doesn't look very Instagram-y, does it? There are no filters, my hair is unwashed, I'm still in my pajamas, welcome to prep life. But it doesn't look very cohesive to all the pictures that you saw before. Because you see, this is more representative of what my everyday, ordinary life looks like day in and day out. You see, when it comes to social media, what we tend to do is we compare our everyday, ordinary lives to someone else's greatest hits, to someone else's best moments, to someone else's highlight reel, and we find ourselves falling short because we feel like we can never measure up. And so all the while we're looking over there, what we have right here is less and less exciting. Now maybe you're here and you're like, well, I'm not really on social media, I don't do Facebook, I don't do Instagram, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on anything. But maybe for you, there's that one friend that you have, that, that one person, and they seem to have this life, this perfect life that you only wish that you could have. They drive the car that you want to drive. They live in the house that you want to live. They have the 2.5 kids with the white picket fence and a dog named Spike that you want to have. And they vacation in Europe, and you've been going to grandma's for your staycation for the past five years. And they seem to live every day in this perfect life that you only wish that you had. And so you keep looking over there, and over here gets less and less satisfying. Um, there's a guy, uh, his name is Chris Beale, and he said, where comparison begins, contentment ends. Where comparison begins, contentment ends. And it's true, isn't it? All the while we keep looking over there, we forget to appreciate what we have right here. 
Where comparison begins, contentment ends. And we find ourselves right in the middle of the comparison trap. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about comparison in relation to ministry. And this is what he says. He says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Now, the Greek word for compare in that sentence is the word sunkrino. Everybody say sunkrino. <laughs> say it like you're Greek. Sunkrino. <laughs> That's better. There we go. And sunkrino, the, word, it, the Greek word, it paints a picture of people standing side by side in a line and looking at each other, judging each other to see who's better. Now, you might say, well, we don't do that literally, but isn't that what we do mentally every time we scroll through our phones or we look at that guy driving the bigger car or we see that person in the gym with his perfect abs? <coughs> Rahan. <laughs> isn't that what we do? We judge ourselves and what we have by what someone else is and what they have. And Paul says, hey, comparing yourselves among yourselves is not wise. It's not good. It's not helpful. In fact, it's foolish. And my suspicion is that a lot of us here, we know that already. This is not anything revolutionary. This is not new news to you. We know that as we keep comparing ourselves, it doesn't make us feel good. It doesn't build us up. It doesn't help us. And yet, we keep doing it over and over again. And today, I want to know why. Why do we keep giving in to comparison over and over again? Well, to answer that question, I feel like we need to go all the way back, back to the very beginning. And so we're going to look at the first book of the Bible, the, Bi the book of Genesis. And we're going to look at the creation story when God created Adam and Eve. Are you ready to read the Bible with me? Yeah. Oh, about five people. Huh? Well, the rest of you are going to be really bored then. Are you ready to read the Bible with me? Yeah. Okay. Let's keep the awakeness going. Amazing. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God creates man and woman, Adam and Eve, the first humans. And this is what he says to them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. He fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. So God creates man and woman and he says, hey, listen, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, the beasts on the earth, all of the trees on the face of the earth, they're all yours. Rule, flourish, dominate, be fruitful, multiply. This is all yours. But there was just one condition. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Adam, Eve, any tree. It's all yours. All the, all the fish, all the birds, all the beasts, they're all yours. You can have easy access to it. They're all yours for the taking. But there's just this one tree, just one tree in the middle of the garden that I don't want you to touch. Sounds easy enough, doesn't it? They had the entire garden. The whole earth was theirs. Just not that one tree. Fast forward to Genesis chapter 3 and... We find Eve, she's chilling in the Garden of Eden, and the enemy comes to her and asks her some interesting questions. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent, he was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, verse 2, uh, we, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, 
the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And that was the moment that sin entered the world. Now here's my question. Why did Eve, why did Eve having everything that she did have, Verse 29, God said, hey, I'm giving you every seed-bearing plant and every fruit-bearing tree. It's all yours. Every tree that is on the face of the earth, it's all yours. And Eve wanted the one tree that she couldn't have. Why? Well, let's just take a look at the language of the serpent in verse 5. Oh, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent tells Eve, hey, don't worry about it. You won't really die. God just knows that if you eat from the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And right there, in that moment, Eve desired to be like someone else. Eve desired to be like someone else. She desired to be like God. Eve, in that moment, desired more. She desired other. She desired different than who she already was and what she already had. She had the whole garden, and yet what she focused on was the tree. Isn't that what we do when we live in the land of Ur, as Andy Stanley puts it, like we heard last week? We want to be prettier like her. We want to be skinnier like him. We want to be smarter like her. We want to be cooler like him. We want to be richer like them. And this incessant cycle keeps going and going, and it's never enough. Why? Because comparison, it breeds an incessant need in us for more for other, for different, than who we are and what we already have. Eve ate the forbidden fruit because she wanted to be like someone else. And don't you find that we're quite like Eve sometimes? That we forget about the blessing of the whole garden that we do have and we long for the one tree that we don't have that we saw on Instagram. We forget about the blessing that is right in front of us, that we do have, that we do possess, and we long for the one thing that we don't have. And very soon we find that we're driving our kids crazy because we want them to keep up with the Joneses kids instead of appreciating the beauty and the life that is already in them. Very soon we find that actually I'm disappointed in the flowers that my husband got me because her husband got her a Cartier bracelet. Very soon I find I'm frustrated about the amount of money I do have because they always seem to have more. And soon these things that should bring us joy, that we should be grateful for, that we do have, that we already are, they pale in comparison to what we don't have. And suddenly we're sat with a roof over our heads, a spouse that loves us, children to call our own, a job to pay the bills, food on the table, a car that gets us from point A to point B, and we're still not happy. Why? Because comparison is a game that no one wins. It's a trap, and it keeps going on and on and on. You see, there's a lie that started with the creation of the world. A seed, a lie that got planted in Eve's brain. And you and I, we still carry this lie. We still carry this seed right now to this day. And it lies dormant very often, but it rears its head when it comes to comparison. And it's this lie that is the answer to the question that a lot of us are asking, but we don't know we're asking. And the question we're asking is this. Am I enough? Am I enough? 
am I enough as a mother? She's got her kids perfect and their grades are great and their teeth are shining and I don't even know where my kids are. Am I, am I enough as a mother? Do, do I measure up? Am I, am I enough as a father? Am I enough as a husband? He takes their family on vacation to France and I can only go to Manjura. Like, <laughs> Manjura's great. Am I enough? Am I enough as a woman? Am I enough as a man? Am I enough as a pastor? Am I enough as a business person? Am I enough as a leader? Am I enough? Because isn't that where comparison leads us to? Isn't that often where we end up when we compare ourselves with each other? We judge ourselves against other people and we judge what we have against what other people have and we constantly fall short and it reinforces the lie that we are not enough as we are, that we are not worthy, that we are not significant, that we are not valuable. You see, comparison, it reinforces the lie that tells us that, that we are not enough as we are that we are not enough as we are. And so the key to beating this comparison trap, for me, is it's less about restriction and it's more about revelation. It's less about restriction, but it's more about revelation. You see, we could all go home right now and we could try really hard because we know comparison is bad, so we're like, okay, well, we're not, we're not gonna do it. I'm going to try really hard. I am not going to compare myself with anybody else. And you get your phone out and you're like, oh, I am going to go on Instagram, but I'm not comparing myself. I'm just, oh, are they in France? Oh, what? No, 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 <laughs> no. Remember the message on Sunday. I am not going to compare myself. No, Manjura is great. Manj hashtag Perth life. Perth is okay. We, yeah, I'm good. No, I'm, I'm not going to compare myself. Or you meet your friend. And she's got three kids under the age of five, and they all look like they get dressed from a Gap advert uh, advertisement. And she looks like she's just off, stepped off the pages of Vogue. And there you are. You haven't showered in three days. You don't know where your kids are, and you've got broccoli in your hair from last night's dinner. <laughs> and it makes you feel insufficient. It makes you feel like you're not enough. And at that moment, you could say, well, no, listen. Yep, broccoli. Yep, she's got lipstick on. I'm not going to do it. I'm not gonna compare myself, it's all good. Like, I am enough, I'm great, this is great. And then she pulls out a basket of homemade scones and you're like, what, are you kidding me? See, we could try really hard, we could grit our teeth and try really hard not to give in to comparison, but I suspect it won't work very well and it won't last very long. So here's my proposition. We focus less on the restriction and we focus more on the revelation. We dwell, we focus on, we think about, we learn on, we live from the revelation that is God's answer to the question that we're all asking. Am I enough as I am? And I want you to hear me this morning. God looks at you, yes you, exactly as you are right there, and he looks at you straight in the eye and he says, yes. Yes, you are enough. But, but God, what do you mean I am enough? <laughs> Broccoli in the hair, don't know where my kids are. Why, why am I enough? What makes me enough as I am? Oh, one reason. Jesus. Jesus. How do you determine the value of something? How do you determine the value of something? Say you put a property on the market, how do you determine its value? Um, my parents-in-law, they've had a property on the market for a little bit, and they've gone through various price iterations because, you see, the value of something is dependent on what someone is willing to pay for it. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. The value of something depends, is determined by the price that is paid for it. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Now here's what the Bible says about the price that has been paid for you. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
God so loved the whole world, that's you and me, that he gave his only son so that you and I, whoever believes in him, will not perish but have eternal life. Romans 8.32 says that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for who? I can't hear you. Who? Us all. That's right. That's you and me. And then 1 Peter 2.24, he says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that who might die to sins? We might die to sins. That's right. Isaiah 53 verse 5, it says, But he was pierced for whose transgressions? Our transgressions. He was crushed for whose iniquities? Our iniquities. The punishment that brought who peace? Us peace was on him. And by his wounds, who is healed? We are healed. You see, it's not really to do with restriction, but it's all about the revelation. The revelation, this incredible revelation that your value, your significance, your worth, your enoughness is not determined by anything else, but it's already been paid for because the greatest price that has ever been paid in the history of the universe has already been paid for you. For you. And so God sent his only, most precious, most beloved son. This is what we celebrated when we took communion together earlier, that this God, this almighty, all-powerful God, sent his most beloved, most precious son to die a sinner's death on a cross so that you and I wouldn't have to. That every sin, every transgression, every iniquity, every mistake, every failure, every forbidden fruit, all the guilt and the shame in the world and the wrath of God for all eternity was laid squarely on the shoulders of Jesus and he paid the greatest penalty so you and I wouldn't have to. That's the price that's been paid for you. That's how valuable you are. That's how worthy you are. That's how significant you are. You see, now no longer does it matter whether she's taller than you or whether he's skinnier than you. Now it doesn't matter whether they drive a bigger car than you or whether they have a bigger house than you. Because you see, the cross of Jesus Christ means that you now are more valuable than anything else. It means that the greatest price in all eternity has been paid on your behalf. And that is why you are enough. That is why you are significant. That is why you are worthy. The cross of Jesus Christ. The cross, it kills comparison. The cross kills comparison. And now, you see, we live in the reality that we are worthy, that we are significant, that we were brought, bought at the greatest price, and nothing and no one can ever take that away from you, ever. It's yours, and it's your reality. But you see, when you let this knowledge go from your head to your heart, it changes your life. I know, because it changed my life. You see, I remember seven years ago sitting in a service and these words, they suddenly became true to me. They suddenly became real for me. For God so loved Sidara Yanushka Utalagama, who wasn't even born yet, who wasn't even born in a small little island called Sri Lanka. She wasn't even born yet. And yet God, this God, almighty God, he sent his most precious beloved son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for my sins, so that when I would believe in him, I would not perish, but I would have eternal life. And so by God, I am worthy. By God, I am valuable. Yes, by God, I am significant. And I am enough, not because of what I've done, but because of everything that he has done. You see, the cross, it makes us worthy. The cross makes us significant. The cross makes us enough. And the cross makes us valuable. The cross of Jesus Christ. You want to beat the comparison trap? You want to stop comparing yourself? Start realizing that you don't have to. The power of the cross of Jesus Christ, it kills comparison once and for all. See, as I, as I look at Eve in the garden that day, She's surrounded by the glory of creation. All the trees and the birds and the beasts and the fish. And, and then the serpent comes to her. And he says, Eve, all this, all this is great, but 
you could have more. You could be more. You could be like that. And Eve, in that moment, desires to be like someone else. Eve desired to be like God. But do you know what the very sad thing is? Eve wanted to be like God. But Eve already was like God. She already was. Do you remember the verses that we read right at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1? So God created human beings in what? In his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Eve, you want to be like God? Guess what? You already are. You were created in the very image of God. He breathed the breath of life into you. You already are. But you see, when we give in to comparison, we give away our identity. When we give in to comparison, we give away our identity. We forget who we already are. We forget who God already says that we are. We forget who God has already created us to be. You see, it's like you're looking for your glasses, but they're on top of your head. You're looking for your phone, but it's in your pocket already. You're looking for something that you already have. You already are. You see, when you want to be prettier, you want to be prettier because you think it'll make you happier. You want to be cooler because you think it'll make you more loved. You want to be more significant because you think it'll get you acceptance. You want to be all these things to get all those other things. It's not about the car or the money or the fame or the holiday. It is about being happy, being secure, being worthy, being loved. That is what we're really after. And guess what? You already are all those things. You see, in Psalm 139, it says that you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am wonderfully and fearfully made. You already are beautiful. You see, in Ephesians 1, it says that you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. You are already in. You already are accepted. You see, in Ephesians 2, it says that you are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do great works. You already are significant. Jesus said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. You already have peace. Philippians 4.19 says that my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You are already rich. In Romans 8, it says that nothing, neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor present nor future, nor powers, nor height nor death, nor anything else in all creation can ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's you. You are already loved. You are already have the things. You possess the things that you so desire. You don't have to be prettier or skinnier or thinner or richer to be loved, to be accepted, to be worthy. You already are because God says you are. God Almighty in heaven, He has made sure that you have everything that you need for life and godliness. And because of the cross of Jesus Christ, you already are loved. You already are worthy. You are already significant and you are already loved. Can we stand on our feet all across this place? Some of us, we need to stop looking around and we need to start looking up right now. Did you hear what I said? We need to stop looking around and we need to start looking up. Looking up at the God who sent Jesus to the cross. At the God who tells me that I am chosen. The God who tells me that I am not forsaken. The God who tells me that he is for me and not against me. The God who calls me a son, who calls me a daughter. The God who says that I am adopted into his family and that I am worthy and I am loved. We have to start looking around and start looking up to God. Can we lift our voices and declare this truth? about who God says that we are this morning. And as we sing, let's believe that something will change inside of our hearts, that we will declare once more that this is who God says I am. Come on, let's lift our voice to church. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not again.
that you are. This is the price that he paid so that you would know that you are worthy, so that you would know that you are valuable, that you are significant, that you are loved beyond belief. In light of this great revelation, who will you compare yourself to now? What more will you long for? The gift of eternity is already yours. Who will you judge yourself against now? What more would you want? The cross of Jesus Christ is already yours. And my prayer for us this week is that we wouldn't leave here with just some new scriptures to talk about. That these wouldn't just be lines on a screen that we sing that just come that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. But this would be truth and revelation to your bones. That this would be truth and revelation to your soul. So that whenever you feel the temptation to compare, whenever you're sad about what you don't have, you will remember that God Almighty sent His beloved, most precious Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for you because that's how much you're worthy. That's how much you're valuable. That's how significant you are. That is how much you are loved. You are loved beyond comparison. And you see, the one who says I am is himself the great I am. And he is the one that will soothe all your doubts. His presence will wash away all your fears, all your insecurities, all the things in your life that you long for. He is truly the only one that can ever satisfy. So as Monday rolls around and Tuesday rolls around and Wednesday comes, remember the power of this moment. Remember what you felt like when you declared the truth of God's word about who he says you are over your life. Remember this and live from this place. And now I hope that it's given you some things to think about this week and maybe some things you want to journal about or some things you want to talk about about in your small groups but can I encourage you please do come back next week Pastor Daniel is gonna conclude this series and it's gonna be amazing and hey if you think that there's a friend in your life that could benefit from this why don't you bring them along as well and uh, it's the custom in our church to go out blessed but before that let me tell you if you value prayer for anything today then it will be our privilege to pray for you so we've got some prayer leaders who will be up here at the front at the end of our gathering and we'd love for you to come and, and get prayer for anything that you want also if you're new please don't rush off we've got a new guest lounge that's just outside those doors we'd love to see you there and we've also got the next welcome dinner happening tonight here at six o'clock We'd love for you to sign up at the connection desk if that's relevant for you as well. But why don't we go out blessed from this place? It's a custom in our church to go out with a prayer of blessing. And so if you've got faith to receive it, why don't you lift your hands and I'm going to pray for us. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, for the truth of who you say that we are. Thank you, God, that these weren't just words, Father, but you sent your son, Jesus Christ. You gave your son, Jesus Christ, as an action, God, so that you and I would be bought into the family of God, that you and I would have peace with God. Thank you, Father, for this incredible grace, for the incredible truth that we get to live out. And Lord, I pray that you help us whenever we are tempted to compare ourselves or judge ourselves. Father, may you remind us that the cross of Christ, it kills comparison, that we are worthy, that we are significant, that we are valuable, and that we are loved as we are. And Father, I want to speak your blessing over all these people here, God. We want to pray the pressed down, shaken together, overflowing blessing of God over their families, over their spouses, over their marriages, over their relationships, over their children, over their finances, over their business places, their homes, their neighborhoods, their communities. Wherever they go, may your blessing go with them both now and until Jesus comes again. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amazing. Thank you so much for being in church, everybody. Have a great day.